I'm still so thirsty. <laughs> but this unreality, this absolute something that you cannot even have a metaphor for. You said they take you out of showers. They take us to the showers, and then as we come is out, it water? showers. It's water. Is it water? It's water. And drink. It's your first water. It's, that's right. And drink. It was, who cared what it was, hot, cold, drink. Now, as we come out, they are thrown rags, you know, to get dressed. Um, whatever I got, who, you know, blouse, purple blouse, white, I, I don't know, but so we had something. And from there, they, they take us not to the structures, but to another kind of an open place with, as I remember, there were a couple of, because we were about 2,000, not, not even that, probably 1,000 girls. They had a couple of smaller structures. It turned, and we stayed there, and I stayed there for four weeks. It was the quarantine. Did you have a bed? No. There were just bunks with nothing, nothing. If you had shoes, you used shoes, and you were six to a bunk. And if one turned, everybody else had to turn. But who could sleep? Did people have photographs of their family? No. How can they? I want you to talk about one thing as a digression here. Sure. Every now and then, there is a television presentation called Holocaust. Yeah. There is a film made. It's not as if there's no horror to the way it's portrayed. But I want you to speak about the difference between the antiseptic presentation that we have seen in movies. And I have never asked you this off camera, so you may love the film, Life is Beautiful. Oh, thank you. I hated it. I didn't want to see it. And it's I don't a lie. Want to see it. oh, it's a lie. It is such an outrageous lie. Any thinking human being can imagine if this was true that they kept, kept they could keep that child, that little boy alive by father pretending and so forth. And that child has seen what he has seen in that camp. That life is beautiful for him after that. Life is miserable for him after that. And that I'm was outrageous. Outrageous. You go in with nothing. Nothing. And nothing. you live with nothing. Nothing. And the only question is, will you survive? That's right. There's no trinkets. Nope. There's no photographs. Nope. No memorabilia from home. No. Nope. You just live with nothing. Nothing. And you do your best to survive. That's right. If you have the will. If I have the will, if I run when the dogs bark and the SS unleashes the dogs, if I do what I am told, which brings me to the word Holocaust. I hate it. Because? I hate it because the Holocaust is something uh, in antiquity. It comes, it, it's a Greek word, Holocaustus. Uh, which is a kind of a offering to gods. I hate that. This was, this was not an offering to gods. I use the word Shoah, which it was, the slaughter. And the word is used so unthinking and so easily, and with such disdain. Casually. That's right. I want to know what a typical day in Auschwitz was for you. No day was typical. Every day had another horror, had another tragedy. But generally, the day was after, well, I was not in the big, la in Auschwitz. I was in Birkenau, 
Auschwitz would have been like, you know, because it has two uh, um, lagers there. Birkenau was where the five chimneys were. The five chimneys That's were. right. Um, Are you suggesting in some way Auschwitz was easier than Birkenau? Temporarily. Temporarily, yes. First of all, they didn't have those rickety um, wooden shacks. In Auschwitz? In, uh, they were in Birkenau, but not in, in Auschwitz. Exactly. They were um, stone buildings. Concrete. Concrete. So when the, the winter came or when there was rain, you were exposed. How many people did you live with in one of these barracks? Uh, I can tell you how, how these koyas, it's a Polish word for, for, for those barracks, barracks beds, bunk the beds, beds, the bunk beds. Um, they were, they had three tiers. The best tier was the top. Then came the center and then came the floor. The most dangerous one was the center because when the Auserin went through and if she was using her whip, which she was using very generously, she was always she would always hit the, the center, the middle. That's where the girls would get it. We would be at time six to one of these Bunk bunks, beds. beds. And um, sometimes we would be eight if, if the transports were coming in. The Hungarian transports were practically the last transport. I know. And I saw the train come in. I saw them being tossed out and women separated. And it was so sad. They must have known where they were because I saw women who looked starved pinching their cheeks to make them look healthy. Let me take a day when I worked in the Brzezinka. The Brzezinka, again, it's a Polish word. It means white. We, they gave us white kerchiefs. That was the only time I wasn't hungry because we had the horrible, horrible job of opening the luggage and finding children's shoes, all those eyeglasses that you see mountains of in the pictures, movie pictures. We found them, you know, all the luggages that we brought along and 500,000 Hungarian Jews brought along because that's about how many they exterminated. I had toothpaste. I had these little things, soap, which I could have gotten a loaf of, well, not a loaf of bread, uh, a portion of bread for a toothpaste. There was a black market behind the, uh, the barrack. Who ran it? Nobody ran it. Uh, it ran by itself. You know, I mean, you could exchange bread for something. Were these other prisoners? Yes. How did the prisoners get the bread to trade? <laughs> they starved themselves for one bread because if, let's say, somebody wanted badly toothpaste or a piece of soap, she would just eat half of her portion one day, half of her portion the other day, and the third day she would have a portion. And maybe she would get one toothpaste or two toothpastes, it all depends. Now, when they were taking us to the barracks to do the sorting, so we had to sort clothing, which then they sent to Germany for the population, nice fur coats, whatever the Jews brought in. Um, I would always smuggle out in my sleeves toothpaste and soap. Now and then somebody found an old piece of chocolate which we dev devoured, but we sort of made it, or at least I made it. I wasn't starving yet. But as we crossed with the dogs on each side, we crossed the man man's camp. And when the women came through the, the road to the barrack where we did the sorting, when, you know, there was an open road, and on one side were the men, on the other side, under, behind by barbed wire. Men would stand there and ask questions, throw names. In other words, 
looking for people. Looking for people. The men would throw female names and we would throw male names. One morning, as I was coming in, I see a man who yells, Fishman Baba. And you know, I keep walking slower and I look at him, I don't recognize him because he's skeletal, skeletal. And he knows apparently that I don't recognize him. He says, I am Mr. Solomon. I used to be her, his daughter's friend. He looked terrible. He looked half dead. So I said, no, he first he asked me about Lily, his daughter. I don't think she, w she went with her mother, and I didn't want to tell him. I said, no, she's not in my unit. And I take out a toothpaste, and I say to him in Hungarian, Shalomon Bachi Moldobni Fogomest. Mr. Solomon, I'm going to throw this. I do that. And then I asked him, did you hear of my father? He knew him very well. Yes, he says, I heard of him. I said, tell you what, I'll bring tomorrow more soap and more toothpaste, give it to him. I did that for a couple of days, and I don't blame Shalom Mbachi, because he had a couple of nice, he lied. But I didn't know, or maybe I didn't want to know. And then one day he didn't appear at the, at the barbed wire, and there was, that he never made it beyond that. But I still, till after liberation, I still wanted to believe against all odds that my father was alive. When you were done with your work during the day, what was the rest of the afternoon and evening? Well, there was, you know, you just went like this. We didn't have concerts, and we didn't have chess games, and we didn't have literary uh, uh, get-togethers, no. As time went on and we were starving, when we did have a moment, we talked about food, and we were cooking. You know, if we wouldn't, I'm going to speak for myself, if I wouldn't have been as starving, as hungry, as I was, my mental capacities would have worked. And maybe I would have gone to the electrified wires and realized that there is no out from here. I cannot, I don't want to take it anymore. I'm not an animal. Did some people go to the wires? Few. And I, my theory is because they couldn't think, all they were driven by was hunger. We went into the garbage to find the peel of potatoes. If, if the Nazis would have given just uh, another hundred calories, thinking, ethics, whatever you want to call it, would have somehow made us realize, what, what are you living for? This is not life. At the end, you'll end up in the crematoria anyway, because by that time we knew as we didn't know in the first couple, as I didn't know in the first couple of days, I kept asking one of the Auxer, another Auxer, and I'm sorry, uh, one of the girl prisoner couples, where is my mother? I said, look, and I look, and I see the, the I see smoke. the smoke, I see, and I say, yeah, so, so he says, that's where my mother, your, your mu, deine mother is. Mondom, mondom. I said to him, sind sie verrückt? Are you crazy? That's a bakery. Everybody knows it's a bakery. All right? And then there came the time when I knew it wasn't a bakery. I, for one, while in Auschwitz, I don't think anything special happened to me because I was only concerned with hunger. How? At what point do you become this hungry? This hungry? Because at, at some point you said you're working, <laughs> That's unpacking, right. yes. and you sort of have some food. That's right. Or, when or do you, you lose know, it? I, I bring in another piece of soap and I yes. get another. That's right. Then 
they take me away from there. See, it's over. Not that they didn't need more sorters, but they changed it. I had two great jobs. The first job was to move piles of stones from one place to another. Don't tell me, I don't know why. Because I had to take it back, just like the Israelites, right? Make work for the Pharaoh. The other one was Waldkommando. I remember that very well. Chopping trees. The one nice thing was that it was next to a river. And sometimes we dared to sort of get in there. But hunger, starvation, nothing else mattered. How and little were you given a day? By that time, we were given, in the morning, Reve, it was a watery cup of coffee, in which, by the way, they did put some kind of a bromide because none of the women menstruated, which in a way was all right. It wasn't painful. Didn't add to hunger. By noon, there came the big uh, kettle. The soup was watery with all kinds of, the less said the better, terrible. But we learned to eat it. In the beginning, I couldn't touch it. First of all, to eat from that dirty, whatever it was, a tin, eat without a spoon. I mean, no, I don't want that. I wanted it very much, very much. And everything was concentrated to eat food, because food was strength, food was power, Food, that's all that mattered. And so I said to myself, if I wouldn't have been so constantly starved, constantly, constantly, dreaming of food, I mean, I would wake up with my, my teeth, my jaws were bleeding because I was um, munching, I was biting something. If I wouldn't have been so hungry, I, would, I might have realized there's no, I knew about my mother. I knew about my little niece and sister-in-law. I would have, I might have touched the wires. I don't know, but I was never given the chance, never given the choice. Well, I assume you did see people who did die all around you. Oh, yes. Did you ever see when someone was literally executed or murdered? Yes. I saw, I saw a woman being hanged. He, she was part of the underground. And we had to stand there watching her being hanged. Um, around September, or maybe it was October, I don't have those dates precisely because nobody had a calendar, there was a, um, a revolt the man, the Zonderkommando, that is the man's commando, who took care of the crematoria and who took people to the crematoria, etc. It, it was terrible. And every five months they knew that it was going to be their turn and another group was coming in. The last, this we found out, in Auschwitz. This last group decided to revolt. And for a long time, I don't know all the details because I was just an ordinary heftling, an ordinary nobody. Thank God I didn't have a job or anything. Um, they decided that they are going to revolt and blow up the crematory, the crematory, yeah. And sure enough, I don't know for how long this was all prepared, the day came when we did hear the blow-ups. Indeed, two of the crematoria were blown up. And I have to say, as later I found out, one of the guys who also perished, and we heard the shots, the men ran into the forest, the Nazis got them. And one of the men was from Siget, which adds to Siget's whatever. Uh, but there was a woman who was part of the, she was, I think, a Greek, I don't know. She came, she was a tall woman who was also part of the underground in, in Auschwitz, who was caught. 
brought back and put to the gallows. And we had to watch it. We had to watch it. And she screamed something before the news. She said something, ich bin die letzte. I am the last one. You'll come next. Do you remember how that must have felt? Oh, see, by that time, it was September, it was cold. And I think it was probably even later than that. Probably it was October, because by December, the camp, the, the Russians really came through. And they wanted to erase all evidence, because they were more scared of the Russians than of the Americans. And they started the um, marches. That's how my brother perished in one of those marches. They took them out from Auschwitz before the Russians eventually came in. And most of them perished during those marches because it was already winter and no clothing and they were starved. And many people perished from starving in Auschwitz at this point. The wind, I, I remember when I used to dream, I had no shoes. And it was freezing. It was cold. And I found on some garbage dump, I, fo I found a pair of those. The, in Holland, you have those wooden klumpas. Do you know what? OK. My feet were frozen. And I used to dream, night after night, that the klumpa that I was having is big, and it's padded with the softest of, of down, and it's warm. This is what I remember. My understanding is that at a given point in time here, the Germans, the Nazis, in Auschwitz-Birkenau actually call certain numbers for the next day. And those numbers are to be executed. That's right. Was your number ever called? Once. By that time, it must have been, it was, I was still in Auschwitz, and I must have been really sticks of bones. And I was put aside. Now, I knew by that time what was happening. And they took a bunch of girls, including me, <sighs> my mother. In a um, in 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 one of those shacks, close the door. And it was a night of lament because we all knew what was going to happen. They took our numbers. We couldn't get out. We had dogs around it. That night, when my number was taken. And there was crying, and there was this, and I just closed my eyes. And I spoke to my mother. And I remember what I said to her. I asked her to intercede for me. I asked her, I asked her to save me. I asked her to protect me. I prayed to her. And so I didn't scream, and I didn't cry, and I wasn't hysterical, because everybody was hysterical. Because I was speaking to my mother. And I said, I know you are going to protect me. I know you are going to. Comes morning began around 5.30, something like that. Even before you saw any light, it was still not dawning quite. The block Elteste comes in, now not the Nazi. And she has a sheaf of paper. And she says, OK, come on, let's go. I have your numbers, let's go. Nobody budges. Come on, do you want me to call you one by one? Somebody says, yeah. I don't know, it got lost. Until this day. As I said, if I would believe in miracles, I think my mother saved me. I prayed to her. 
the sheet of paper that included the numbers, the numbers of all of you in that's this That's right. She didn't have lost. it. Because so she, she couldn't call you by she number. She couldn't call us by number. She wanted you to volunteer. Exactly. She says, come on, come on, you know, you know, come on. Nobody budged. Was your number ever called again? No. No. Never. Forgive me for asking. No, don't. I'm Were dying. you ever sexually abused? No. No, but let me tell you. I went in the camp a virgin and I came out a virgin. However, this is when we are now transferred from Birkenau and uh, um, many people are taken into the long marches and I dream of the uh, down in my klumpa. The hunger was incredible. That's when I went into uh, a, a pile of pot garbage, potato piles, and ate it. Now, there was sex going on, but who, the men who worked very hard, they had it a little better. They had to survive, they did what they had to do, whether it was Auser Commando or, 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 or whatever. And they had girls. And we all knew where it was. It was in another camp. It was called Lager C. Say Lager C. It was, this is where they took us as they started to um, get rid of the incriminating evidence in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in Birkenau particularly, and still maintaining this camp C where there were no crematoria. And it was anus mundi, worse if there is such a thing. Um, it was worse? Yes. Because? Oh, because there was let din let dayan. No law and no judgment. Everybody stole from everybody else. There was no food. I was terribly hungry, terribly hungry. But you know, I believe in truth. I was ready to do anything, anything. And I remember one night, I was so hungry. I mean, I couldn't think straight. I knew where the rendezvous was, and I went there. But nobody, if somebody would have approached me, OK, for a piece of bread, yes. Because they, you know, there were pairs, the man knew. You know, I was a newcomer, a Hungarian one, and then maybe they saw my barely had any hair, whatever. But I was there, but for the asking. This is how hungry I was. This is how hungry I 